Amen. Um, I'm going to start right away by trying to manipulate your emotions. Um, I'm actually going to have Pixar do it. Some of you guys know this four-minute segment that Pixar put together. It's the story of two people. Their names are Carl and Ellie. Right? Yeah, get the tissues out. Here it comes. Um, If you're online, I just want to say to you guys, welcome to church. We love you guys. Um, We cannot legally stream this clip on the stream. So you guys are going to have a link in the chat right now, and you guys can go and watch this. Hit pause on this. Come right back to us, and we'll talk about it. Roll the clip. Let's go.
No, right? Take a minute. Gather yourself. <clears throat> it's a lot. Um, I, it's amazing how they can capture a life like that in four minutes. And they can capture a beauty like that in four minutes. Um, it ends sadly, but many of us are watching that unfold and we're like, but it's not really sad. It's actually a victory because what they created was something beautiful, something pure, something strong, something good. Uh, you don't get to 70 years old and you're still holding hands. Um, you don't do that easily. Amen? I'm going to need some amens second service. <laughs> um, it's so powerful, I would say, that it's something that uh, inspires us. It's the kind of thing that whether we know it or not, we've got it in the back of our minds. That's the dream. That's the dream for many of us. And so today we're going to talk about that dream. And we're going to talk about why sometimes we don't get the dream and how to recommit ourselves to that dream. We're calling this series, it's a four-week series, we're calling it I Like You. And here's the fundamental underpinning of the series. Sometimes we love each other in our romantic relationships, but we don't like each other anymore. I'll let that sit for a second. But we're called not just to love, but also to like. We're called to be committed, but also to be passionate. In love and in like with the person that God has given us. Can I get an amen? amen. So today we're going to talk about how do I be in like with this person? And then next week, we're going to look at what if I've fallen out of like with them? How do I resurrect the likeness with them? Week three, we're going to look at our kids and say, do you love your kids, but you've stopped liking your kids? You don't have to raise your hands right now. It's okay. <laughs> we're going to talk about that. And then in week four, how to love God, but also like God. Because those are two different things too. So it's going to be an exploration like you saw in the announcement video. That, that Linger seminar is coming up because we know sometimes, uh, especially as couples, um, sometimes something this deep, this big of a deal that we need to do, we need to take multiple steps in order to get there. So we're going to do some of the steps here in this series, and then you've got a seminar that you can sign up for. and You can go even deeper, a little bit more intensive on a Saturday night talking about your relationship. we got Bible studies and stuff coming after that as well. Um, little disclaimer here to those folks in the room where maybe you're single, you're not in a romantic relationship right now. A couple things. Number one, hmm, the Bible has this way of teaching us things that we don't think that we're in the season or ready for yet. Still read it, still listen, still engage. Um, it may be that you're in a spot right now where you were in a romantic relationship and you're not right now. The Holy Spirit in his kindness may be coming to you and he's going to do some healing through this teaching about your past. It may be that you're in a spot right now where you're not in one of those relationships, but God's got a relationship like this for you in the future. I'm not making any promises. I'm just saying he might. And so he might want to disciple you, teach you, grow you so that you're ready when that time comes. And then the third thing I'll say is that many of these passages, even in the original context, are very focused not just on romantic relationships, but on friendships. Because in our friendships, we need to not just love, we need to like as well, because we all need that. Amen. And so what will God have for you? Turn on your brain and find out. Back to Carl and Ellie. Carl and Ellie, 70 years and still holding hands. If you're a couple here today and you're not holding her hand yet, this is just your hint. You might want to you might want to start. How many of you want that? How many of you want that? You might just want to quietly whisper uh yes or you might want to squeeze her hand right now. Just a hint. Um how many of you want that? 
when we stood before the pastor and we said, I do, um, I will love, honor, and cherish, and then lose interest and do the bare minimum for the rest of our lives. <laughs> it's not what we said. It's not what we dreamed. And the dream is a captivating dream. And, and, and the dream that Pixar put out there for us, and, and I know I'm giving Pixar a lot of credit, but I'm going to prove to you today, it did not come from Pixar. Pixar stole this from the Bible. Pixar stole this from the scripture because God's plan for a romantic relationship is not duty and commitment only. Commitment's good, by the way. Many of us grew up, we saw a generation behind us that stayed together and they stuck it out and they had commitment and we respected, admired their commitment. But I'll just say this, commitment only without the passion is not what it's about. It's not what we dreamed of. Here's the sad way that some of us do relationships. Sometimes, number one, we try to find the right person because if we can just find the right soulmate, everything's going to be great. Number two, we fall in love. Number three, we fix all of our unreasonable expectations and hopes on that one individual. Number four, we fail and we start back at number one. You're like, well, that's dark. I know. But isn't that sometimes the way it's done? And we got to talk about the bad news before we get to the good news. Uh, we start off strong. I love you, but I don't like you. Jesus says I have to love you, so I guess I'm in this. Or we'll stick in it for the kids. We'll stay in it for the kids. Sounds so admirable. But we're phoning it in. We're roommates. It's a relationship of necessity. There's a lot of chores to do. There's a lot of money to keep up with. And so we'll do these things, all this dark stuff. At some point in Christian history, and I'm not sure when it happened, we took what the Bible said about not divorcing. We took what the Bible said about loving a person in covenant and, and being strong in that, even being willing to sacrifice. And we did. We, we, we sadly, subtly turned it into an excuse to bring the bare minimum into our Christian relationships. I don't think that's what God had for us. I'll say it like this. Life at the bare minimum is not life. Say it with me. Life at the bare minimum is not life. And, and you've listened to that lie. These are things that maybe I don't need anymore. These are things that maybe I can learn to live without. The flutter in the heart, right? Like, no, no. The Bible talks about being and like. Let me show this to you. And this is just a smattering of verses here. Genesis 29 speaks about Jacob and the fact that he was so in love with this woman, Rachel, that he wanted to marry, that he worked for seven years. But when he worked for seven years so that they could be married, it seemed like just a day to him the scripture says, because he was so in love with her. That doesn't sound like strong commitment, sacrificial love, does it? That sounds like hearts all aflutter. Ezekiel 24, 16, Ezekiel's wife was the delight of his eyes. In Song of Songs 8, it says that love is as strong as death. Many waters cannot quench love, it says. Song of Songs 4, 9, you've captivated my heart, my darling, with one glance of your eyes. Song of Solomon 3, 4 says, I held him and I would not let him go. And Ephesians 5, 25 says, love your wives, husbands, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, being willing to pay any price for her Amen. is the way that every husband should be for his wife, willing to pay any price. The Bible knows something about passion. Proverbs 5, 18, I'm going to read to you. And my disclaimer up front is this is one of the most PG-13 verses in all of Scripture. So you have been warned. Uh, but it is massive in its importance. So verse 18, let's dive right in. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Okay, the, the most important phrase that sets this whole little passage up is wife of your youth. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. So if I'm rejoicing in the wife of my youth, then that means I'm a man and I'm an older man. 
Now it's possible in the context of the passage, he might be talking to a middle-aged man and just saying, as you get older, as you approach old age, you should keep loving the same way that you do today. But love the wife of your youth. Love the wife of your youth instead of who? Instead of anybody else. Don't go rejoicing in other people. Not, not in that way, at least. The sad story, again, is sometimes the marriage happens and decades later, the eyes start to drift and the attention starts to drift and we start to drift. And he's like, don't drift here. The wife of your youth, rejoice in her. He's talking to Carl here, by the way. Do you see it? When you get older, when you get older, you might be tempted. He also says rejoice in her. Um, that word rejoice there might seem small, but it's actually big. The word rejoice is uh, sama, sama in the Hebrew, and it literally means to brighten up. He's like, brighten up about the wife of your youth. Joy up, glad up. It's a verb. It's not, it's not a noun. It's not a result. It's it, it, it's, it's not something that happens to you. The feelings come on you. It's a decision that you make that I'm going to brighten up about our relationship. I'm going to bring gladness and joy again into our relationship because maybe I've stopped seeing our relationship. Maybe I've stopped feeling excited about our relationship. So glad up in the relationship. Next verse, 19, a lovely dear a graceful doe. He's, he's talking about her beauty. He's talking about seeing her beauty. If you're going to joy up, if you're going to glad up, you need to see her again. Have you maybe stopped seeing her? Maybe. See her again. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. That's the PG-13 part. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Sexual love. It's part of it, right? Um, be intoxicated always in her love. Be intoxicated always in her love. Be intoxicated is another Hebrew word, shiga. Shiga means uh, to, be, to be drunk. It means to, um, the, the actual word picture there behind that one is, is someone who's stumbling around. They've got a, a staggering gait because they're so drunk they can't walk in a straight line. He's like, be so filled up with her love that you can't walk in a straight line. Is that passion? That's a hardcore commitment. I'm suffering through this marriage because Jesus suffered for me. No. No, I'm so passionate about her. I'm seeing her again. Right, like I, I'm intoxicated with her. Some of your translations say I'm captivated by her always with her love what are we talking about here? We're talking about older people who are still intoxicated with each other. That's a biblical idea. Oh, Carl and Ellie and Pixar, they stole it from this verse. Do you see it? We got to teach this kind of biblical expectation and biblical love to each other. Sometimes we just, we expect small things. And then verse 20, why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a foreign woman? He's using the word intoxicated again here and embrace the bosom of an adulteress. The reason I read this third part to you is because it's, it's just, it's part of the continuous thought. And what he's implying here is he's implying that if you aren't intoxicated with the wife of your youth, you may go off and be intoxicated with somebody else. Why? Because there's a need in the human heart to be intoxicated. I'm not talking about alcohol here, right? There's a need in the human heart to be passionate and to have somebody be passionate about you, to experience the fire. You want the fire. What you've told yourself about, it's okay, I'm in a new spot in my life and I don't need the fire anymore is wrong. You need the fire. Be intoxicated with the right Person. So I'm going to go back to the two central verbs in this passage. Be joyful about him or her, and then be intoxicated with him or her. It's, it's two verbs there. They're not feelings. They're actions that we're called to take. How do those actions make you feel? If you're anything like me, they might make you feel a little bit frustrated. What do you mean just be more joyful about her? 
What do you mean be intoxicated? Like, how do you do that? It just tells me as if it's obvious and sometimes it doesn't feel obvious. I think it's actually more obvious than we think it is. Um, but we can talk about the how for just a second, but I think the how is gonna surprise you because I, I think the how is, is actually deciding that it must be done more than this is exactly how to do it. Um, I'll give you an example. I think in our lives, and this is everything, I think sometimes we have this kind of ought to gear, like someday I ought to do this. And then we have the must gear. Do you know what I'm talking about? So I, I heard an old uh, pastor, and he was a father, and he was talking about um, just a season that they had gone through in their life. And, and he and his wife had taken one of their kids. They have many kids. And they, they took one of their kids to the doctor, and the doctor said, the asthma in this kid is so bad, you're living in the wrong climate right now. And you're going to have to move them immediately to a different climate. And the dad's sitting there like, how in the world are we supposed to do this? We don't have savings for this. We don't have a plan. I don't have a job anyplace else. But when he was telling the story, he looked back and he's like, somehow we did it. Somehow we scraped it all together and we sold a house and we said goodbye to everybody and we went someplace else and we set up shop, house, church, job, everything at a whole new location. Why did we do it? Because we had to. Because somebody told us they made it plain and said, this is a must do for the good of your children. So you do it. It's amazing what we human beings are capable of when we must do it. Face that. Procrastination. How many of you are procrastinators like me? You know, the hands go up fast. That's good. You're honest with yourself. Isn't that, isn't that the essence of what procrastination is for us? Don't we spend the first part of the week in the ought to do gear? And then as the week goes along and we're within like maybe 48 hours of the deadline, we shift into the must do gear, right? We must do it or we're going to die, like literally die. <laughs> And there's something about that. Like, well, we're, we're willing to lose sleep, go without meals in order to get the final thing done. Well, what is the difference between the two? We just shifted. We knew it had to be done now. If only we could have better control in our lives of that gear shift, yes? It's the same thing with this passage today. I need you to joy up about your marriage. I need you to be intoxicated with your spouse. How do I do that? First order of business is it's a must do, not an ought to. You gotta live in this gear. And, 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 and I know, I know, you can't put everything in that gear. You wouldn't be able to live. But this has got to be there and you've lowered your expectations and you've let it go and it's time to get it back again. Just, just real practical, like this is the spot where it's like, if you're going to take anything away from the message as far as a practical to do today, that I hope you'll actually do, this is it. Go out on a date. Go out on a date and have a must-do conversation, a for real summit conversation between you and your loved one. How are we going to do this? Because now it's a must-do. You're like, well, we don't have money for a date. Go to McDonald's, buy a bag of fries two waters. Eat, eat the fries. You can do that. Pick a night this week. Why this week? Because it's must do. You don't wait two weeks on must do. You do it this week. Pick a night Go have your McDonald's fries and have a summit and look each other in the eyes and say, how do we get from here to Carl and Ellie? Because when I went to the altar and said, I do, I was saying, I do to Carl and Ellie. And I want it. And it's a must for me. You got to say that to each other. You got to mean it to each other. Because once you're there and you're on the same page, the Bible says, not only can we be captivated by each other all the way into old age, but we should be. But we should be. 
Once you decide that and you're on the same page, then all the other questions start to come. Well, what needs to change then? There's a, there's a verse in Song of Solomon. Um, it talks about the foxes. It talks about your love like it's a, like it's a wine vineyard, a vineyard full of grapes. And, and in Song of Solomon, they say, uh, our, our vineyard, the vineyard of our love is so beautiful and so healthy, but these foxes are coming in. Somebody catch the foxes before the foxes ruin the vineyard of our love. And I know that's a very flowy kind of poetic thing, but what are they saying? They're saying there are things that if you let those things in the house, they will ruin your marriage. And we have let foxes in and we got to deal with them. Things like financial debt can come into your relationship and be such a source of stress every single day, such a source of fighting and argument every single day that you never get relief and there's no space for your love to actually bloom toward each other. Some of you have been there. Sometimes it's in-laws. Sometimes the in-laws are just too hardcore in the middle of everything. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> they might give more than you do. I say things off the cuff and I shouldn't do it. <laughs> what are the other foxes? Um, addictions. Things that felt really small when you were dating and they've gotten really large. And they're things that we don't talk about. Or they're things that one of you says, well, I'm kind of working on it. And again, we're in an ought to space. We're not, not in a must stage. And so we're not making the real decisions and really going after that stuff. And you're sitting there at McDonald's and you're going to talk through all of that stuff. And what time do you need to be home from work so you can have dinner together? And what do you need to do with the kids? <laughs> what do you need to do with the kids? All of that stuff. And, and, and there might be a part of you that's like, well, wait a second, the kids are important. Yeah, they are important. But you know what the kids need more than anything? The kids need mom and dad to be healthy. The kid needs, kids need mom and dad to, to be passionately in love with each other so that they can grow up seeing how it's done and long for that kind of thing themselves. I remember being a kid, and uh, we went to, I've told the story before, uh, we went on vacation with my grandma and grandpa, and, and my mom was a single mom, and, and we, were, we were there. We were there for several days, and, and all of a sudden, two days, grandma and grandpa disappeared, and where'd grandma and grandpa go? And I asked my mom, and she's like, well... They went off to a marriage conference. Why would they do that? They're perfect. Like, I know them. They're perfect people. Mom just says, they had something and they wanted it back. And here's the thing. To make a decision like that and know the grandkids might ask about it, they might notice you missing and that that might uh, touch your ego just a little bit, that you're not a perfect person and that you do need to work on stuff. All of those are decisions. But I grew up with grandparents who made decisions like that and let us know about it. I love the idea that we're going to fight for us, that we're going to do what it takes to fight for us. You guys at McDonald's this week, fight for us have a summit, what needs to change? Change it. Be captivated by her. Uh, Mignon McLaughlin, an author from the early 1900s, said this, a successful marriage requires falling in love many times, always with the same person. Next verse, Ecclesiastes 4, 7. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is also meaningless and depressing. So this is Solomon talking in the book of Ecclesiastes and he's like, you can meet all of these life goals. You can have amazing purpose and you can build all of this stuff, but who are you building it for? And if your relationships at home aren't strong, then what's the point? What's the point of getting to retirement with a great looking 401k, but you're not talking to each other anymore? 
It's about friendship. It's about who you're doing it for. And so the rest of the passage, he, he talks about the benefits of that friendship. So verse nine, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. Two people are better off than one. And I'll just, I'll say this quickly. He's not talking about two different people living in the same home, but living like they're alone. He's talking about an actual partnership. Gosh, we, married folks, we've all had seasons where it felt like we were two different people and we had our rings, but we were living different lives. I know you've been there. This is better. Do better, yeah? Yeah. So two people are better off than one. Oh. And look at the first kind of success. You get success in the quest, um, success in your purpose, success in this life. It's career, it's money, it's kids, it's, it's house, it's, it's all the different things. You can just help each other succeed, right? You can split the chores. You can do the work. Um, and it's not just about splitting the chores and, and who picks up who from what kind of, you know, little league, whatever. It's not just that. It's the fact that two of you, see, she can see things that you can't see. Because she's got wisdom that you don't have, Yes. And she's got gifts that you don't have. And so you just find yourself in every single situation better than either of you would have been alone. Let me talk about Linda for a second. And, and, and please draw your attention to the interpreter on your screen because she's going to have to interpret all this stuff I say about her right now. And um, it's going to be very, very fun. Um, Linda's got better laughter and better humor than I do. It's just true. Um, her creativity, her house projects. Um, I would leave the house uh, very tidy and organized, but very boring. Um, Linda brings all of that. Um, we took Gracie back to OSU on Friday and moved her back into her room and it's sophomore year and I was ready to just move the boxes up and just load them into her you know, living room there and just walk away like, good luck. Um, <laughs> And Linda wants to like put the pictures on the walls and stick around and all this kind of stuff. And she's giving me shopping lists to take to Walmart. You're going to go buy all of this stuff. And I've never spent so much at Walmart in my entire life <laughs> as Friday. Oh. It was, yeah, I expected more paperwork when I walked out, but they didn't have it. But Linda's just generous. She's strong where I'm weak. She's wise where I'm foolish. She just is. Even when we uh, in the past uh, have worked with couples, I'll sit there and talk and, and I'll share a lot of stuff because that's what I do. I monologue at people. I'm just, I just do. Um, and when I'd finally shut up and create some space here, Linda would clear, you know, um, uh, take a breath and start to speak. And you, you could just see the people lean forward toward her when she would start to talk just because she's got wisdom. And it just, it's always instructive to me um, how she has things that I don't have. Um, next verse, verse 10. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. This is help in the hurt. This is massive. This, in the storms of this life, and you guys have been through them, the medical storms, the financial storms, but also the emotional stuff. You need a partner. Isn't it great when the partner is there? Let me just remind you, these benefits come from real partnership where you don't just love each other, you like each other. Because some of these things, if you've built distance, this stuff doesn't come. It's just true. So build it now. Go to McDonald's now, amen? Um, helping the hurt. Our mental health struggles, we need help for those things. We need somebody to listen to us and get us through. Verse 11, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone, warmth in the cold? Um, that's a verse about cuddling right there, amen? That's, that's good, good stuff. Um, uh, in your friendships, I don't think this is cuddling in your friendships, by the way. Um, in your friendships, I think this is a note about loneliness, 
and about the fact that we just need other people in our lives. We need someone to share it with. Um, if God's got you outside of a marriage season right now, those friendships are bringing that kind of um, partnership to you. I think this is also intimacy. And intimacy is a word that, again, we kind of steal over to the physical so often, but intimacy is bigger than that. Intimacy is emotional intimacy as well, and maybe even more importantly, um, let me talk to you about intimacy for a second. It's, it's spending time together, but not just spending time together. It's about going there with each other and the other person knowing you and the other person knowing you for real all the way. Like they know your secrets. What are your secrets? You know what your secrets are. Do they know all your secrets? Because they need to. Why? Because as soon as they know all your secrets, here's what happens. Your mask comes off. You've got a person in this world who actually knows you, knows the real you. And when they know you, the real you, and you can't hide anything from them, here's what starts to happen. You feel a peace. Because if they accept you, they've accepted the real you. And if they love you, they're loving the real you. And that's, that's a whole other thing, guys. There's a, there's a peace, there's a wonderful peace, a deep peace that comes over you. Verse 12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Amen. <laughs> this is about strength. It's about protection when you're in the battle. It literally says, you got my back. That concept of like, who's got my back? That comes from this verse. It's right there. How much of your life is like a battle and you need somebody to have your back in that battle? It all depends on the season that you're in. But if I put a word on that, it, it would kind of be loyalty for me. Is again, we're gonna fight for us and we're loyal to us above everything else. And that loyalty matters. Like I choose you. Everybody else is gonna come and they're gonna vie for my attention. They're gonna vie for priority. They're gonna vie for time. But I give it to you because that's loyalty. And when you need me, I'm there for you. And when we go on the, 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 the holiday trips and, and you're feeling uncomfortable with a, a member of the family or a friend is attacking you or an enemy is attacking you, guess who's got your back? I do. And I'm gonna listen to you and I'm gonna be there for you. In the first few years of, of our marriage, I struggled with this concept. It was very real for me. Um, I wasn't on Team Linda every single time I needed to be. Sometimes I got confused by that. Sometimes I even Christianized the reasons that I was going and I was helping other people do things or get things done in their house instead of helping my wife get things done in our house. Does that make sense? And I had some older Christian gentlemen come and set me straight on that. Very thankful for that. The last thing it says, three or even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Christ at the center. It's a surprising last phrase from this passage in Ecclesiastes. And it's surprising because everything has been about two or better than one. So you would naturally get to the end of this passage and you would expect to see a two braided cord is strong. Like that would be the final thing to say. But it doesn't say two braided cord. It says three. All of a sudden you've got a third person involved here. Who in the world is that third person? Christians down through the ages have seen this as Christ. Christ comes in, that you have a way of weaving Christ, not just into the relationship, but into the center of the relationship, and he makes everything stronger. Amen. And this is real. I mean, it can just sound like, oh, nice, you know, Hallmark card kind of, a, kind of an idea. Bring God into your relationship. But this is real. Why? Because the world has not taught us how to love correctly. The world's got it wrong. And the way Jesus loves is actually the way that it works. And the more we can sit at the feet of the rabbi and learn from him, yes. how do I actually love? Because it's not working over here. And when it's not working, I go back to him and say, what am I getting wrong here? Because you love perfectly. And if I brought your perfect love, Jesus, into this relationship, this thing would be going differently. And what, do you, what am I doing? Well, 
she did that thing again, and she's done it so many times, and I've forgiven her so many times, and I'm sick of forgiving her, and I'm sick of understanding, and I'm sick of making excuses. And Jesus says, how about you forgive 70 times 7? Do you see it? He's the one who comes in and says, no, you weren't paying attention. Get back in your Bible. Learn from me what love actually looks like. Well, she's not worth my love. What do you mean she's not worth your love? Well, she ticked me off today. So yeah, I know what she needs, but she ticked me off today. She doesn't deserve my love. Come on. Just Jesus loves the undeserving. It's his whole thing. And he sacrifices for us. He'll pay any price for us. His love, if we could just get a bit of his love into our relationship, everything would start to work. And I'll, I'll finish you off with just this one kind of a way that he comes into the center of a relationship that I think has made so much of a difference for us. Is he fixes the idolatry problem in our marriage. Here's what I mean by that big word. We come into the marriage and we bring these expectations that you're going to be the one. You're going to be the one that finally meets all my needs. All these other people failed at meeting my needs, but you're the one who's going to do it. You're the one who's going to love me the way that I need to be loved. No one else all my life has understood me, but you're the one who's going to understand me. And when you finally step up and understand me, then my life will be complete. Renell Zellweger? Zellweger? Jerry Maguire? You complete me? We'll finally have the you complete me moment. At last. She lied, okay? She lied to all of America. And, and, and we all listened to it, and it broke us all. Um, it's touching. It's just not true. Um, we can't complete each other. You're a broken sinner, and so are they. And when you came into the marriage with two broken sinners, in a way, you kind of had no chance. <laughs> Jesus comes into the center. He becomes the perfect person. Jesus comes into the relationship. He's the only non-broken person that's there out of the three of you. And all of a sudden you find that Jesus completes you both. Jesus makes it all work together. Okay, let's pray. Would you guys stand? Lord Jesus, we need you in our marriages. We need your example. We need your forgiveness. We need your patience. We need all of it. God, we surrender to you right now, Lord. Come in and and change us, Lord. God, we confess that we've settled for a bare minimum, and that's no life at all. So Jesus, I pray that you would drive us to those McDonald conversations, Lord. I pray you bless the conversations. I pray that we would see the priority shifts, so we would see the repentance, we would see the changes that we need to make for us, and that, Lord, you'd bring change to us. Oh, and God, across this room, some of us are really struggling to hope right now, Lord. God, we've, we, we've, we've let things slide for so long and we've, just, we've stopped believing it can be different. And so Jesus, would you come right now, Lord, and, and would you give us a supernatural um, blessing, God, in our hearts, God, of, of fresh hope. Stir us up again, Lord. It can be different. Thank you for saying these powerful things in your word. In Christ's name, amen.